Um, okay, well, let's let's get started. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Joe Tracy. Um, and I, I want to add, uh, before I even tell you about him, I just want to say a little bit of a personal note, which is that um, Joe and I have known each other for many years um, through the Philadelphia neuropsychology community um, and various meetings that we've attended together. And I've always been um, a great admirer of, of Joe's work. Um, he's uh, the director of the neuropsychology division and uh, of the cognitive neuroscience and brain mapping laboratory uh, and a professor of neurology at Thomas Jefferson. Um, he got his PhD from the New School of Social Research and had, and he has an ABPP, American Board of Professional Psychology accreditation in clinical neuropsychology, which is a, um, which is a, an important, uh, uh, I don't know, title, I suppose. Um, and his area of research focus is epilepsy and the, um, intersection of epilepsy and, and memory processing and language processing. Um, and I think more recently, Joe, you've been using doing some resting state fun functional connectivity work uh, with right, approaches yeah. including graph theoretical analyses. Um, and, and I think it's also uh, it was interesting to me up. that, um, Joe, you've collaborated with uh, Sorry, I'm not home. I'm in Florida at my my mother's. Um, so I can stop my camera. Let's see if that's any better. Is can you uh, can you hear me any better? I still now? hear you. You froze up a teeny bit, but now okay. you're okay. Okay. Um, so um, he's collaborated with our, our friends and colleagues uh, formerly at Penn or still Penn, including Dorian Pustina and Penny Bassett. And today's presentation is titled The Brain Architecture of Seizure and Cognitive Networks in Temporal Lobe Epilepsy. Thank you, Joe. Well, thank you, uh, Laura, for the kind introduction. And we uh, originally were gonna do this, I think right when COVID hit. And so thanks for re-inviting me. Uh, now we're, uh, you know, I, I don't mm -hmm. wanna say COVID's not over, so I can't say after COVID, but uh, in any event, thank you for re-inviting me. I guess I should do a screen share to get us started. Okay, so as uh, Laurel said, I'm gonna talk about, can everyone see by the way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm gonna talk about seizure networks and cognitive networks, and I will really focus on temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, I've made findings from uh, ORA1, and then uh, through the years, various postdocs have had fellowships. Uh, Dr. He, who was uh, involved in a lot of this work I'll be presenting, uh, had one that I certainly wanted to mention. So I want to convince you that uh, even focal epilepsy is a network disorder, and uh, do that by showing you that networks neuroscience can really be applied to some important clinical issues in epilepsy. One is seizure generalization, and I'll try and show how there's networks that undergird uh, this uh, very important clinical issue uh, that if we can, can fix, will really make different, a difference in patients' lives. And the second uh, clinical issue where I'll show that uh, these uh, networks uh, can be very valuable in predicting surgical outcome. The overall notion of networks in, in focal epilepsy is that it has these broad extra temporal effects that uh, may be very important in capturing really the full effect on, on the brain. So um, then I'll move on and talk about cognitive reorganization, uh, ways of uh, using dynamic measures to uncover the, the networks that might explain some of the deficits in, in epilepsy using uh, language as an example, and then focus, if hopefully I'll have time to get to a memory study looking at a very special group of temporal lobe patients who despite their pathology, have uh, intact memory and use them as a guide uh, to adaptive reorganization. So the paradigm shift that's occurred in a lot of disorders is this uh, notion of brain uh, networks. And in the setting of seizures, it means that these seizures, uh, even focal seizures do spread out and propagate through the brain and through processes that aren't 
unlike uh, kindling and LTP. In fact, I've heard uh, physiologists talk about seizures, you know, being LTP, you know, gone wild, sort of gotten out of hand. The hypersynchrony of, of seizure has some similarity there, uh, but the idea is that these networks do set up biases uh, in pathways among regions. They're not fully random. There are some patterns that seem more likely than others. Uh, but they certainly don't have Darwinian qualities of adaptation. They don't need to make cognitive sense. And if you can capture, I've always, you know, believed and gotten into connectivity because I believe it, it allows us to capture the reach of these networks throughout the brain. And in that way, they're, they're a good, you know, surrogate of the disease process. So this is just a good example from Vanilla, one of the uh, major researchers. This is a volumetric study. Very clearly, you know, very easily see these extra temporal changes in, in focal temporal lobe epilepsy with gray matter reductions really through, throughout the brain. Oh and this is um, a study, uh, this is a review of the literature that I was uh, involved in. And uh, what it, it's doing here is basically trying to make the point that whether you look at structural networks through diffusion uh, or intrinsic networks through say resting state, uh, you get pretty similar characteristics in terms of overall network organization. And that is increased clustering and increased path length. And uh, this is kind of a hard figure to make sense of, but there's a couple of you know, cartoons that really do uh, depict and uh, describe it well. So you can see a regularized network over on the left the increased clustering is all these kind of nearest neighbor triangles uh, that don't really form good modules, uh, but you can see that they could easily be recruited into a hypersynchronous seizure uh, and it's increased path length. In other words, get from A to B, you know, the posterior uh, occipital to frontal lobe, you have to do a lot of steps. Uh, you know, there isn't an efficient, an efficient uh, pathway. It's kind of the opposite of a random network and very different from the normal small word network world network that characterizes brain health. Uh, I like this one because it just gives a, a good sense of how the normal brain has these characteristics of a, a good spread of, of modules, um, not being overly dominated by any one hub, like in the upper, upper right, uh, and having this good mix of short and long path lengths. Uh, you know, path lengths are very important in terms of gauging metabolic demand and the efficiency of communication and having, a, you know, a good, good balance of modules. So the regularization, uh, you know, if I had to use a word to capture the, the broader whole brain connectivity research in epilepsy, uh, that's what it would be. So I did, a, I think, one of the first studies I did getting at this idea of, of network uh, applications and network disorder and epilepsy was to focus on interictal activity in temporal lobe patients. So I took a group, uh, temporal lobe patients, it divided them in, into this unilateral group where the, the spikes were pretty much just on one side, and then another group where the spikes were on both sides. Uh, and uh, after dividing them up that way, did a very simple seating of the, you know, ic the putative uh, ictal temporal lobe and found the same thing both for right and uh, left temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, so you see the temporal lobe and what, what I found was that the, the group that maintained that unilateral, you know, where the epileptiform activity was more restricted, had this anti-correlated activity contralaterally in, in particular. And I, I called it a protective surround. So this adaptive anti-correlated activity may play a role in keeping uh, the epileptiform activity more focal, and at least on, on just one hemisphere. The bilateral group uh, lacked that, so it seemed to, to be uh, have some functional importance in terms of uh, restricting the seizures. So I want to use uh, uh, network neuroscience to get at some uh, important clinical issues in epilepsy. One of them is uh, tonic-clonic seizures, uh, you know, generalizing from focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, and really find the hidden circuit that might be supporting that type of generalization. Why is that important? These are patients who have severe mor morbidity, higher risk of uh, sudden death and epilepsy, uh, very likely to have a poor surgical prognosis because the thinking is the generalization is representing a network that might be building uh, elsewhere in the brain. So you take out one area, you still have a, uh, some ep epileptic focus left behind. And I think I uh, mentioned earlier that, that these patients are, uh, much more difficult to manage, have to be monitored, and families are very, very pleased if you can reduce generalization and just, you know, have the old complex partial seizures, uh, as they used to be called, uh, and those are much more manageable in, in terms of quality of life. 
So I wanted to pursue a network and actually did an uh, earlier study uh, with Chao Sung He where we showed corticothalamic connections and that how they differed in focal and this generalized group. So we, we did something different. We focused on a different network and showed some disruption uh, in a gang, uh, basal ganglion th th uh, cortical loop uh, published in Brain. Uh, this is just a depiction of, of the sample um, uh, that we did uh, separate the, uh, the, the frontal bilateral tonic-clonic into the ones who were having them currently in the past year or ones where it was just more remotely. And we do mostly get the strongest effects with the current group. And they're there, that I'll, the main effect I'll show you is there with the remote group, but it's not as strong and both of them are, are uh, you know, different from the, 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 uh, the, the controls. So I used uh, uh, you know, a masking technique, basically I wanted to find a uh, mask for these different regions in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. Uh, I found 21 regions using you know, a basal ganglia atlas and then the HCP atlas that you may know for some of the bigger regions. And then uh, the idea was to you know, see what regions are communicating with what using a community detection method that's uh, you know, well, uh, known in the literature for the people doing the, this kind of graph theory work. It's es essentially taking uh, the preference, figuring out the preference of interregional communication. In other words, regions cer cer don't uh, you know, communicate equally uh, with every other region. There's some biases, some favored interactions. And so what you can do is use these community uh, measures and you, if they belong to the same, uh, two regions along the same community, the presumption is that they're in closer communication and have that sort of bias in communication. So there were three findings that were uh, of interest. Uh, it's important to say they were all on the ictal side. And this uh, focal bilateral tonic-clonic group, the one with the, the generalized seizures, had globus pallidus uh, striatum increases uh, in, in integration, and then decreases in the globus pallidus, the, the subthalamic nucleus, and the thalamus. We did some additional work to show that this is uh, probably being driven more by the uh, globus pallidus interna than externa. Uh, and this is just a, 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 piction, a depiction of, you know, this is a graph that you may know from Parkinson's and motor disorders. And I wouldn't necessarily apply this as a model for epilepsy, but it, it just depicts the connections I just, you know, articulated. And the net result of really of, of each of these uh, three findings is that there'll be uh, reduced globus uh, pallidus inhibition. And as a result, the thalamus gets less modulated and the thalamus is excitatory to cortex. And so you can picture this excited to increased excitation, activating particularly motor structures in the cortex, excuse me, and being behind these, these tonic-clonic motor, uh, you know, motor movements. So the focal to bilanic uh, were associated with these disruptions that I mentioned, basal ganglia and their input to the thalamus, decreasing inhibition, reducing this modulatory control that would be normal uh, and upregulating the thalamus uh, and promoting generalization uh, in that way. So we hope that that can eventually lead us to at least early invention identifying those susceptible to bilateral tonic-clonic. So the next sort of application in network neuroscience that, that I uh, hope to be able to uh, contribute, you know, practically speaking to prognostication in the setting of epilepsy. For those of you who know epilepsy, uh, you know the anterior temporal lobectomy is the most common procedure. There's, you know, lots of new techniques and we're doing studies at Jefferson with, with, with you know, really all the new techniques. But ATL is still widely used. It's still, uh, in some ways, it really does have the overall best efficacy, at least in the, in, in the first year, thermoblation doesn't do quite as well. There's a lot of thermoblation patients who end up having an ATL. Uh, but I didn't want to get into all that. But the most important thing that, uh, to mention is the ATL is, is very disappointing. You know, this primary technique for pharmacoresistance where medication doesn't work, you do surgery. By five years, the, the rate of recurrence is really not good, 50%. And so that's, that's really disappointing. It's about 75% one year out that, that'll be seizure free. So what's, what's going on? Why does surgery fail? You know, is there something in, in uh, connectivity and network science that we can do to, uh, to see if there's some clues pre-op? Obviously the best thing to have is some pre-op measure, right? To prognosticate. Uh, and so my you know, working hypothesis on this is that there is, there may be an occult kind of ghost network that is epileptogenic uh, involving extratemporal regions, regions. It's already there, it's already established. 
and it wouldn't be taken out by surgery. So it would be very active in generating seizures, either through a whole new independent focus um, over time. Um, and uh, so, you know, th that's the, the preoperative shaping that you could see pre uh, that would uh, lead to a bad outcome. So this was published in neurology. We used a, a Hubness measure, pretty well known in, in graph theory. Uh, we didn't study, we just studied ATL, not other types of, uh, of surgeries. There are different, you know, types of of surgeries that I'm not really mentioning, uh, but we used one uh, outcome of one year, which is of course, a, you know, doing it at five years makes it hard to do studies in some ways, but that would be better. But one year is a very common outcome. Generally considered that's, you know, kind of a good picture of how things are gonna be. People are, patients are kind of stable at about one year. Uh, so, you know, kind of a, a mixed group, um, uh, you know, with, uh, I classified patients following them over time and then, you know, retrospectively uh, uh, classifying them as seizure free or not seizure free and then a set of uh, matched healthy controls. So I used, you know, fairly standard correlational analyses developing matrices with the 90 by 90, you know, parcellation scheme with, you know, good thresholding and different densities to see the effect across different thresholds. And basically tried to look at hubness in these different regions, you know, in our in our parcellation scheme. And we, what we found is that the uh, the thalamus using this hubness measure was the one that separated the groups. So, so we found uh, you know high hubness uh, in. Uh, well, I, I just uh, forgot to just quickly those of you who aren't familiar, hubness is basically high density. It's a region that because of its heightened connections, you can see in the lower right of all three types of uh, of uh, uh, hubness, it's densely connected and it implies that that's an important brain area. It's obviously got some priorities in terms of uh, information flow and connection that, that others don't have. Uh, so it's an important area of the brain and that's why we chose it to, to, to use to, to identify potentially what might be unique about the seizure free and, and those who, who recur. So uh, we, we found that the thalamus was the best uh, region, the hubness of the thalamus was elevated very clearly in the not seizure-free group. So that it was a bit there with the seizure-free group above the controls, but was uh, definitely different and higher in the not seizure-free group. So that seems interesting. Something's going on in the thalamus that's bad for outcome. That's uh, some hubness measure and connectivity uh, density there is, is bad for surgical outcome following ATL. So in these types of studies, it's really good to uh, kind of challenge your data a bit. You can do that by going into your matrices and uh, performing surgery on the matrices, knocking out the thalamus. And so we knocked out the thalamus, removed those connections, and basically tested out the, the importance of the thalamus, looking at a, a, a brain-wide, whole brain uh, measure of organization uh, global efficiency, which is a good way to get it, uh, kind of whole brain organization changes. And indeed, we found the largest drop uh, when we knocked out the thalamus, the largest drop in uh, global efficiency in the not seizure-free group. So it looks as the thalamus, in a sense, is most important to the organization of that group. So it looks as if the thalamus you know, is, is, is indeed important. The humness uh, may be important. Uh, so the second thing is, you, you know, if the, if the connections of the thalamus, the high hubness was related to the temporal lobe, that's pretty uninteresting. I mean, you know, we know the temporal lobe is epileptogenic, and if all the, you know, dense connections are from the thalamus creating the high hubness are coming from the temporal lobe, you know, sort of big deal. That's that's no, no surprise. So we wanted to, to uh, simulate, essentially knock out the temporal lobes, which is in a way simulating uh, surgery. And uh, indeed, we found that uh, that high hubness, uh, you know, in the not seizure-free group was maintained. In other words, that quality, uh, even without temporal lobe connections, they still had the high hubness relative to the other groups. So the connection to the thalamus didn't seem to involve the temporal lobe, which is important to say there's something unique about the, the connections of the thalamus. Uh, so we did this, then, uh, you know, simulations and knockout strategies, but then wanted to go on and find out really what uh, were the connections. Hubness is a very broad measure. It doesn't say anything specifically about any particular, uh, you know, pa pair of connections or paths. So we, you know, dug into the data and just looked at the group differences in the outcome, you know, poor versus good outcome, and the particular connections coming from the thalamus that are, you know, causing this group difference. And uh, lo and behold, we find that really thalamic connections 
uh, both sides uh, of the thalamus in the contra, you know, the non-ictal, the, the contralateral side of the brain has all these pathways that are found in the poor outcome group. So it suggests that this high humness is driving these pathways in the supposed, you know, the healthy part of the brain that, you know, you want to be there protecting against seizures, perhaps doing some of that anti-correlated work I showed you before. But the, the point is, this represents, I think, and this is, uh, you know, the way we kind of interpreted it is that ghost network. We think that, that those sets of connections are that, that ghost occult network that you can capture through thalamic humness. If it's there contralaterally, it would uh, worsen the prognosis. Uh, so, as I do in a lot of studies, I try and take a, a, a feature or factor that seems uh, of added value and make sure it's of added value by comparing it to existing measures. And there's tons of studies in, in outcome following ATL. So we took some of the basic demographic and clinical information, uh, you know, predictors of outcome, uh, and uh, see, you know, if we added the hubness, uh, flame and hubness measure, would we get significant improved classification? And we did. So it, it does seem to be providing some added value. So let me go on to uh, cognitive networks and try and see if uh, uh, we can find some basis for deficits using uh, connectivity um, that uh, you know, will, will help explain performance differences. And part of the motivation for this study is that uh, I do uh, fMRI mapping uh, prior to surgery. Uh, just to map out eloquent tissue and, uh, you know, memory language, motor sensory, a variety of different things. But certainly in the language is probably the most common. You know, the surgeon always wants to know what the dominant hemisphere is. You tend to take less out from the temporal lobe if, if you're in the dominant hemisphere. So language laterality is very important in terms of surgical uh, planning. And uh, what I noticed is at a group level, you know, you do the language test comparison, uh, and you don't get these group differences that you would expect. The maps can look pretty similar. So when you do, uh, you know, tests of, uh, you know, versus controls, you, you just don't see a, a difference in the voxel-based simple block design activation patterns uh, in, in tests like verb generation. So that those laterality measures are, you know, gross measures across the entire task, there's kind of some averages, they're, they're static in other words. So uh, with the advent of uh, dynamic measures, you know, coming from Danny Bissett's lab and, and elsewhere, uh, took some of those and tried to apply them to see if they would reveal some features of uh, network uh, uh, changes during the task uh, and see if these dynamic changes are somehow better at, uh, you know, co kind of correlating with the performance groups so that patients, you know, tend to do poor on things like verb generation. Uh, so this is published in, in Brain and we found this disrupted uh, network that, I, that I'll tell you about and uh, used a simple verb generation task. It's very robust at mapping out uh, dominance in patients. Uh, it, you know, you present a noun and they have to think of an action word, you know, ba basketball would be bounce and a knife would be cut and, and that kind of thing. Simple block design because they're, you know, tend to be stronger than, than uh, you know, trial-based designs. Uh, and so through this test, all, all the patients I'm going to talk about were left hemisphere dominant. I did look at right and temporal lobe epilepsy and get similar findings, so that's important to mention. Anyway, so the, the focus on the language subsystem is to uh, take uh, the kind of the break it into some key systems, a frontal kind of interior system with some parcels on the left side, and then a temporal lobe system, a posterior language system, and do the same with some homologous regions on the right side. We, so we have these four broad systems that have, uh, you know, regions, parcels within them. And then we just took the data of, of this verb generation task uh, it windowed it. So that's a common technique to get at some of these dynamic measures. And at each window, you can compute, you know, separate measures. And then what you do is what, what you're doing is basically saying at window one is window two, the same as window one uh, and window three, the same as window two. It's, it, the basic question is, does a region belong to the same community in the same system at one window as a subsequent window? Uh, or does it change? And you have these uh, mathematical measures that are fairly straightforward. There's some that are simply just uh, counts of the frequency of you know, the, the, the membership in a community. Flexibility is, is kind of the easiest one. It's just the number of times a region tends to be assigned to a, a different community across, you know, across time, across, across the task. 
or this communication preference that's captured by the notion of recruitment. And if you can see the cartoon there, recruitment is staying within a particular system. So a region might stay within the left frontal or right frontal, you know, communicating with the other regions there, but not going, excuse me, outside and communicating with, with other regions. What captures the uh, communication and kind of a community assignment with regions uh, different than your original system is this notion of integration. Now, uh, this is a dynamic, it is actually similar to the one I talked about before with basal ganglia, but now this is dynamic looking at changes in integration. So there are two findings that are, uh, that are key here, both uh, in both left and uh, right temporal lobe patients. Uh, they were less flexible. We basically found that in uh, the left temporal and right frontal systems, the flexibility measure uh, was lower, lower in the patients uh, than the controls. Uh, and it's not there during rest. So rest is, is, a, is in a sense kind of a control condition. We wanted to make sure that this effect that we might find is not the tonic baseline condition. This is kind of implemented and uh, you know, instantiated during, during a task. It's not there all the time. Flexibility, as you may know, has been uh, reported widely through a lot of studies as being adaptive cognitively. It's a sign that the person is, you know, rearranging networks in response to the changing task demands and practice and things like that that go on. So it's 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 uh, it's when you're less flexible uh, that certainly you you would uh, suspect that that's correlating with lower performance. So the other measures uh, to report on them, uh, so to speak. So we found reduced uh, recruitment. Um, within the left uh, frontal system, you know, and that contained BROCA, so you can call it a core. Uh, so within that region, those parcels are uh, communicating, uh, you know, being assigned to uh, the, the same uh, uh, community at, uh, they're, they're communicating less with each other uh, uh, within that system. Um, and that's going on in, in the left of frontal regions, both for right and temporal lobe patients. And the, the, in, the integration measure is the one that gets the systems talking to each other, uh, one node outside into another system. This intercommunity assignment actually was also present in the uh, left frontal and right temporal regions. So we went on to see whether these are, uh, what the actual integration is. In other words, what's kind of integrating and interacting with what. And it does end up that the left frontal was indeed integrating with the right temporal. So they both have high integration and it's driven by the fact that they are switching back and forth. Regions are switching back and forth, membership between those two systems. And again, it's important to say it's not during rest, this is driven by the, the demands of the task, the network system demands of the, of the task. So in terms of, uh, you know, sort of at the end, trying to see if it has value in predicting uh, something like verbal fluency, you know, actual uh, behavior, you know, outside the, the scanner, we found the flexibility not unexpectedly was related to higher verbal fluency. Uh, high integration was not. So actually the fluency scores with folks with uh, high integration was lower. And so first glance, you would immediately say there's something about this high integration that's harmful. It's, uh, you know, a network that's creating problems during, you know, a word search, a lexical search as part of verbal fluency. And that obviously could be true, but it also could be, you know, we're capturing these patients in the midst of, uh, you know, a particular period in the development of their seizures and perhaps recovery from seizures. And so we're, it could be that the integration is actually eventually going to be adaptive. We're kind of catching them in the middle when it's flawed and uh, incomplete. And then, uh, you know, try to, uh, you know, as I did before, try and take uh, some existing more common measures of static fMRI uh, using these laterality measures as an example of that, and look to see uh, if the dynamic measures that I've described, uh, integration and flexibility, predict the actual neuropsych verbal fluency better than the static measures, and indeed they do through, you know, random forest uh, machine learning technique. So now, uh, lastly, let me go on and, and talk about uh, some potential reorganization and using network neuroscience to help you know, find you know, some of the characteristics of organization that are particularly adaptive. So there's a substantial subgroup of TLE patients who have adequate memory. But how do they do that? You know, what, is, what is it about the you know, naturalistic course of their 
disease and their response to it, that they were able in the setting of hippocampal and, and temporal lobe disease to maintain adequate episodic memory. It's, it's, we don't know much about that. So it's about 30% that, that, that you often have intact memory. So it's an interesting subgroup to, to study in terms of reorganization and compensation. We don't know much about the regional task activations. We don't know much about the connectivities that might be implementing or, or supporting this, uh, this intact memory. So that's what I wanted to study. I divide uh, the groups into, into intact and impaired. And this was published uh, recently in Brain Communications. Here's the pipeline. Uh, it, the, uh, the test, the memory test we used is a pretty well known one, paired associate learning. You present a, a pair of words, uh, instructed to memorize them, and then you have a, a arithmetic, a pretty easy arithmetic uh, interlude uh, that wipes out, you know, rehearsal and working memory. And then you give a single member of the pair, a member of the pair, and they have to, you know, provide you uh, they get a correct response if they do give you the, the second member of the pair. So we looked at just successfully remembered trials. This is a trial-based analysis. And as you may know in the literature, when, when you, you bin things in, in that way, you, it tends to get called subsequent memory effects. So these are activations I'll show you uh, are all related to successful memory uh, in, in these intact and impaired groups that I devised. So the second stage was to find the connectivity. So, uh, uh, generalized uh, psychophysical interactions are a great technique to, to look at connectivities during, say, one condition, you know, the task uh, in, this, uh, in this case, but not connectivities that are not there during the control condition. So that's kind of the interaction part of it. So we take the, the SME uh, regions and we, we go and find the broader network present during the test, but not during the control. And then, you know, at the end, do, as I do with a lot of studies, do some predictive modeling to see with a technique like support vector machine learning, look the magnitudes from the uh, straight F SME or the, the connectivities from the GPPI, which are better at distinguishing the intact and impaired groups. So this is just a, a, you know, a description of the, of the groups and the, they did differ. Uh, in accuracy on this paired associate memory test with the patients doing better. Um, the, uh, I would have used uh, patients directly as uh, sort of a good and poor intact and pair, but very few, to, uh, excuse me, I would have used the controls as a comparison group, but I couldn't find enough controls to be impaired uh, to do a, a, a comparison like that. Uh, so th uh, this is just the straight uh, SME effect. And what's interesting, I think, particularly if you look at the the 3D volume at the bottom row there, um, the, the right temporal patients look pretty similar to the healthy controls. Um, there's, you know, the absence of much in the way of uh, right hemisphere activity, uh, you know, and there's this some posterior activity and then the inferior frontal. They didn't, on a voxel-wise basis, differ, so there's no statistical difference, but uh, the LTLE, the left group, the left temporal group, did differ from both the right and the controls. You can see that there's more right hemisphere activity in the uh, left TLE group, and uh, most interesting, there's bilateral hippocampal, not unilateral hippocampal uh, involvement. So uh, I, as I mentioned, I'm mostly interested in the attack versus the, the impaired group, uh, distinction to look at potential compensation that would be supporting and intact functioning. Uh, found these set of uh, regions that are associated with intact status, the uh, right-sided regions involving uh, the posterior temporal gyrus and right cerebellum and Heschel's and then the bilateral hippocampi. So sort of uh, one of the conclusions is that there does appear to be greater right hemisphere involvement with the intact group versus impaired in that direct comparison. That those are right sided regions, not in the impaired group. And I kind of struggled a bit as to what to use as the seed for the connectivity to probably, to be more thorough, could probably seed every region found in the SME map, but decided you know, to use the, the uh, memory hub, the one that, that we know from uh, literature is very important to episodic memory. So with this group having a bilateral hippocampal SME effect, we see to use that as the seed, the bilateral hippocampus as a seed. And we get a variety of different uh, connections and many of them involve, uh, you know, the, there's a little bit of the DMN there, the, the DAN network is there. So there's some intrinsic networks, the salience rep network is represented, uh, but there's very strong superior uh, marginal uh, uh, connectivity and uh, right-sided and fear parietal activity. 
So we get some uh, connectivity effects that are right-sided as well, as well as magnitudes from the stratus and me effect. So to, to look at uh, what's uh, better through uh, support vector machine learning at some distinguishing tact and impaired, uh, we find that there are six variables uh, that uh, produced uh, reliable uh, classification, good classification uh, at separating those groups. Uh, four of them were these magnitudes from the uh, the um, SME effect, and then two of the were, were uh, functional connectivities. Uh, the functional connectivities were all right-sided. Uh, the uh, magnitudes were mixed, um, and, and two right-sided areas, two left. So based on this, um, I felt that there were two features that were uh, we could you know, say were unique to the intact compensated patients. Um, they showed this upregulation of activity uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, it's kind of a computation, a primary computational region. We know that that's a core uh, episodic memory region, so it's a it's a primary computational region. Uh, but then we get these other uh, characteristics related to a set of activations and functional connectivities that seem to be providing computational support. Uh, and they're only present in the intact group, uh, compensated group, not the, not the impaired group. So we get this unique pr uh, profile of non-ictal, non-dominant hemisphere regions, right posterior temporal was the strongest involving a combination of regional activity and increased uh, modulatory communication with the bilateral hippocampus during the task, but not rest. And these were missing in the, in the impaired. Uh, it's important to mention that these were not contralateral hom homologs of typical left hemisphere memory areas like the inferior frontal cortex, you know, right inferior frontal cortex wasn't part of it and that certainly is involved in, in memory. Uh, and then it's not, um, these are regions are not traditionally considered, uh, you know, computationally primary regions and they weren't uh, when I did a GPPI in, in the healthy controls and looked at the stronger memory group uh, and the weaker memory group with them, they didn't uh, have any of these, uh, these uh, connectivities that I uh, showed in, uh, in the intact group. So it looks like these intact group have adaptive abnormalities relative to the controls that are providing this computational support that helps implement and ensure effective memory performance. And what I think is important is that you know, certainly the hippocampus is always the structure that when you do temporal lobectomy, people are fearful will knock out and decrease memory. But uh, you know this data suggests that obviously that that's important. Knocking out the the hippocampus is going to have effects. But it may, what, what is is going to perhaps make a difference in terms of maintaining function is finding out the probability that the person's gonna produce this other set of uh, reorganization responses and the failure to do so may be just as responsible for the worsening of memory after surgery as, as the failure to generate that supportive compensatory network may be just as important as the, the uh, knockout of the hippocampus. So just to uh, summarize, I hope I've, uh, uh, convince you that there's good applications of some network neuroscience technique in, in epilepsy. Uh, I showed you basal ganglion network disruptions and it may be very informative for finding out patients uh, prone to this, uh, these secondary generalized seizures that can be very disabling. And thalamic hubness I think has very good potential and I'm trying to do this uh, to uh, develop an algorithm uh, for those who have it in, in, in spades versus those that don't have it and see if I can come up with a Bayesian sort of odds ratio uh, to predict surgical outcome based on that, that hubness. Uh, and, you know, tried to show you that dynamic measures have, I think, in many respects, greater potential, maybe superior at explaining some of the activity or organization that's behind deficits uh, in the temporal lobe patients. You know, I gave the example, obviously, of fluency and found the abnormal flexibility and in the integration there. And then, you know, tried to use a network approach in a unique group that seemed through the course of nature to found their, find their way to intact memory, uh, even in the setting of temporal lobe disease and found some, uh, you know, interesting reorganization effects that weren't in the, uh, there in the impaired group and that, you know, may have some uh, value in terms of in personal brain therapeutics, understanding some of the networks that you need to get going and support and stimulate uh, to, to uh, generate, you know, uh, work brain recovery uh, in uh, in the setting of, of disease. So those are those are the studies I wanted to go through with you, and uh, be happy to talk and answer questions. 
I do actually just quickly want to go on and thank uh, these two folks in particular. Uh, Xiao Sung He is a great postdoc. Uh, he was with Danny Bissett and now has a professorship over in China, and I can't wait to visit him. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Dr. Sperling, he and I are, uh, you know, very close colleagues through the years, uh, virtually involved in, in all our studies together. So uh, they were very important to the study, uh, as well as uh, Kapil uh, Shadhari did uh, some good work on, on some of these studies as well. Um, thank you for, very much for your time uh, and uh, very much, very much appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. That was Thanks, Joe. extremely interesting. Um, I, I see um, John has his hand up. I have, I have some questions too, but um, John, why don't you go ahead and we'll see if anyone else has any questions. Thanks. Um, Joe, very interesting uh, talk. I really appreciated it. Um, uh, this wouldn't uh, contradict your sort of prognostic uh, uses and so on. I think you sort of implied that these network changes develop through the kindling process are, are, are developed by the epilepsy itself. Um, and I guess I'm just uh, curious, and you use words like reorganization, which imply a process over time. I'm just curious um, whether there's evidence from longitudinal studies, say, where pe people are recently diagnosed and then studied again later, because it seems like at least theoretically the alternate possibility that people have different brain organizations that uh, that predispose them to uh, better or worse forms of epilepsy and better or worse outcomes uh, are already present. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, I certainly uh, didn't at all mean to sort of summarize any literature related to the uh, pathophysiology of, uh, of um, the hypersynchrony that's behind seizures. That's a, that's a whole area uh, and it's not my area of expert expertise. Uh, it is, you're bringing up an issue about, you know, if you do find abnormalities, when, when does it occur, right? I mean, you know, these, I, uh, you know, find these hubness measures. I mean, who knows? Maybe they were, maybe they were there since birth. It's very hard to know longitudinally. Uh, so, so, so that's correct. I'm, I'm, uh, it, you know, you rely on the group difference that you create, right? So you, you sort of say to yourself, you know, they're both temporal patients. They're matched on almost everything I can think of. Uh, the pathology is mixed, but it's sort of the same mix in both groups. And, you know, if it was longitudinal and there all the time, you know, why is the, the group difference, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, it, 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 if they're matched in other ways, it, you know, longitudinally, you should find it in both groups, but you find it only based on your group difference. In my, in my case, it was surgical outcome versus a uh, good outcome versus poor. So, but ultimately, it begs the question of when these changes occur. I, I totally agree. And a longitudinal study is how you would, you know, uh, parse that out. Thanks. I had a kind of related observation and then an unrelated one or a question. Um, the, the related question is whether you have ever found that length of time since the original diagnosis there has any bearing on different patterns since uh, some of the compensatory changes that you might see. Sorry, not my house. I'm happy to hear a dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. If any of these changes may have evolved over the course of the, the growth of a tumor, for example, um, and whether the length of time since first onset of seizures or first signs of any kind of pathology may be a mark of how much reorganization has had a chance to occur. Yeah, so I uh, always include as one of the key clinical features is, excuse me, age of uh, first risk, if, you know, it's considered the presumptive time where the disease might have started. Um, it's, it's, you know, that's iffy, you know, it, it, MTS might not show itself and people may not sit with it for a few years and then they finally go to the doctor and say they have seizures and all of a sudden the onset is uh, when they see the doctor at age eight, but they really started at age six, you know. So, but I, the point is I always do include age of onset and, and duration. And I've been very surprised. I'm actually doing study now to, you know, duration, um, age of onset is sort of developmental effect, right? Disease onset at some phase of cortical development, you know, Piagetian stages, if you want to view it cognitively. And duration is like a chronicity effect. So I'm trying to do a study now that looks at the interaction uh, and trying to parse out. But generally speaking, 
when at the end of a study, when I insert duration or um, uh, chronological age of onset, not chronological age, it, uh, it, I, I guess I'm sort of, uh, not, I don't have every study in my head when I say this, but surprisingly, I would say most of the time that covariate doesn't make any difference in the effect, which is very surprising. So, um, you know, there are certainly effects in the literature, but, you know, not as much as I think you would suspect. Um, uh, does anyone else have a question? I'll add, save mine until the dots stop. I think Dylan has one, I think. Dylan? Thanks, Joe. That was uh, what a fascinating uh, talk and a really exciting area of research. And I'm thinking of it through a neurophysiology, you know, looking at it through a neurophysiology lens. And I'm wondering if, um, to the extent that you could probe a different part of the network to see the modification, you know, test test this network theory physiologically, modify a different node, and ideally or hypothetically via the thalamus, see how it might affect the EEG around the ictal temporal area. Um, yeah. but just from a, from a testing out the theory and from a treatment perspective, I know for the treatment there, you know, they have these, um, I think treatment focuses for a non-surgical treatment with this uh, approved stimulator, you know, is around the ictal region that is like a pacemaker for that region and stops the spreading depolarization. But I'm, I'm wondering whether you could target both for a treatment, uh, a different part of the network, or where, and if people have done that, if you know if that's in the literature or even in uh, yeah. the deep brain stimulation targeting subthalamic nucleus or something like that. Yeah, the interior nucleus of the thalamus is, is uh, a study that's been done. Uh, and it is being used uh, clinically. We were one of the sites for it. Uh, the recovery rates are just a little, you know, the, the, the effectiveness rates are a little over 50% of the sample showing, uh, you know, a demonstrable change, reduction in seizure frequency. So it's not great, but it is being used. Uh, you know, that's a targeted approach. You know, you have to you know, you're going at one structure, but there are other approaches where, you know, you could, you could put the leads anywhere and, and uh, often, um, in surgery, what if the not confident about the the focus? You know, don't only do surgery when you know the focus. If you're really not that confident, but you know this one area is bad, so you want to take it out. You leave leads in, and then uh, if the surgery doesn't work, you can then start stimulating the leads in this therapeutic way. Um, you know, one of the one of the problems, and I think uh, you know Danny Bissett's group in the setting of, of epilepsy has has done work uh, to try and figure out when you stimulate the brain um, and would apply to Parkinson's as well. The, the problem is knowing where the stimulation is going, right? I mean, so what is the, you know, the receptive field, so to speak, of, of, of the stimulation? Um, until you know that, it's very hard to gauge, you know, what sort of neurons are really responding to it. Um, so I know that's, uh, that's one big issue. Yeah, um, but stimulation is definitely the, the wave, wave of the future. Um, and, you know, there are, as in a lot of aspects of clinical medicine, you know, there are techniques that work and we don't know why. You know, VNS seems to work with a vagal nerve stimulation, seems to work with a subset of patients. No one really knows why, but it seems, you know, seems to help uh, reduce generalized seizures. And uh, the, the, you know, the mechanism of it isn't clear. It's obviously some downstream effect to get into the central nervous system uh, in that way. So um, uh, this may be oversimplistic, but another thing I heard you say, uh, I think was um, the implicated contralateral area was not the homologue in many cases. It was kind of a different, it was a different anatomical location. So from frontal to, to parietal, I'm just thinking uh, in, in the uh, neurostimulation field, often they go to the to the homologous contra contra. Right, right. Uh, I'm not sh sure uh, exactly uh, w which um, 
for, yeah, I'm not sure if you're referring to the dynamic study where I talked about left and right frontal systems and left and right temple. They they weren't exact homologs of each other. Uh, so if you're referring to that, you know, they were uh, not exactly precise in the two hemispheres, you know, aren't, aren't uh, 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 you know, precisely identical uh, in different areas like the plane and temporality and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, the, the contralateral hemisphere, you know, is an important one to use as a comparison point in a, in a lot of these, you know, in a lot of these studies, you can capture an organizational characteristic there, different from the, the uh, ictal hemisphere, then that's a nice comparison point. Uh, but, but there was another part of your question I don't think I responded to. Uh, no, that, no, that was, that's fine, thank you. Other questions? I had a, I had a, oh, Erica, go ahead, Erica. Just really quick. Um, so your last study looking at individuals who, um, you know, show better memory performance. I just wonder, because the memory task that you used is inherently linguistic, um, and I, I guess if you think that the results might change if you did like a spatial memory task um, or something else that doesn't so heavily require that they encode and maintain lexical representations in the encoding of the memory. Yeah, I, I suspect that the uh, regions that I found that are present in the attack, whether you're talking about the task magnitudes or the connectivities, are, are pretty uh, task specific. Um, I haven't done studies to, to know how far it might generalize, but I suspect there's a lot of test specificity and certainly the verbal uh, mediation is, is a big part of um, the, the regions that, that I reported in the attack group. Um, you know, remember that you know it's the the, uh, the the in the left group, any verbally mediate, mediated task is tapping on the the dominant, uh, the language dominant hemisphere, and that's uh, where the pathology is. And so, if you were to devise a study that the primary network, or at least the dominance of it, or if you want to call it that, or the the hubs of it, are in the healthier hemisphere, the non ictal hemisphere. Uh, you know, you, 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 well, first of all, you'd expect, you know, that the integrity of uh, performance would be better, right? Uh, but you'd, you'd expect that the reorganization effects, if needed, uh, are, you know, very, very different than when you're, uh, the pathology is really attacking a hub, you know, of, of the, the, the cognitive function that your task measures. If it's not, a, the pathology is not hitting the hub, uh, you know, I, I think you're going to get very different uh, you know, compensatory effects if, you know, if there is a decrement in, in performance, uh, if they have intact performance in the setting of pathology, even though it's on the other side. And by the way, uh, temporal lobe patients, left temporal lobe patients, a good majority of them, uh, you know, yeah, easily, I would say 60% of them have visual spatial me memory deficits, uh, you know, the large proportion. It's not unusual at all to have, um, uh, I've come to believe less in material spe the specific memory effects after being a neuropsychologist on an epilepsy team. You often get visual spatial memory deficits in left temporal lobe patients. So Joe, maybe I can ask my question now because I, it bears on the sort of laterality effects that came up in a number of studies. And I just want to make sure I understand them. how I may not have gotten this right, but um, in the last study you presented, where you looked at the par paired associates of the subsequent memory effect, people with better performance had increased connectivity um, on, in the in right hippocampus and right hemisphere regions. Is that is that right? Right, right. And, but and, okay. And then, but then I wanted to, you to help me make sense of the fact that earlier on you had talked about when you're talking about seizures, um, increased connectivity in the right hemisphere was actually a, a, um, a negative pro a prognosticator. Uh, uh, you know, sort of the more connectivity you had to the right hemisphere, the more likely you were to have bad outcomes in terms of seizures, right? In terms of, in terms of surgery. So, I yeah. guess it, I guess the take home, yeah. So I guess the take home message is that I, I see. 
So the outcome, so, so the surgical outcome measures and the behavioral test specific, you know, laterality effects may sometimes go in real in different directions. And I'm assuming it's just going to take a while to sort of make sense of all, all of these uh, differences between your studies. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would not view those two right hemisphere effects, you know, compensatory right hemisphere uh, findings, uh, you know, from of a cognitive, you know, nature in the temporal lobe group, and then seizure network findings involving, um, you know, different regions of the, the right hemisphere uh, supporting poor outcomes. So, you know, the seizure network, um, of, you know, doesn't, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with the cognitive network. Um, you know, the, uh, it's, it's certainly possible that the patients with poor outcome had a compensated memory. I guess I just view them as, as different networks. I haven't really looked to see exactly how much those thalamic contralateral connections that were poor, uh, be interesting to do to see if there is, mm -hmm. you know, any overlap uh, superficially. I don't think there, there may have been, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, the cognitive networks are, are different than the networks supporting seizures, I guess is my main answer to what you're saying. Thanks. Time for another question. Well, thank you very much. I'm thank you very glad much. Glad to uh, uh, present to your group. I have a very, and always have had a very, very strong group at uh, the MMRI. Uh, I always remember that conference at that mansion, John, that you organized uh, <laughs> several years ago with yep. the group out there. That was very nice. Yep. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks for thanks for thanks, joining Joe. us. Thanks, Joe. Sure. And, and uh, Great talk. We look forward to interacting more starting yeah. this fall. Okay, Maybe very at the good. Mansion, we can we can get back to this mansion. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be our new our new lab space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Great. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank okay. you everyone. Thanks, Laura. Right. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank you.